Okay, perfect, perfect, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so what, uh, what season are you on on RuPaul's Drag Race? Oh my gosh. Well, I can't remember the number, but it's the latest season. Um, like and the one that's on right now with Nicki Minaj? Yeah, she was the first judge. Um, Normani was the latest judge. And now on this episode, um, they have the, um, the heartthrob from Mean Girls. Uh, I forgot his name. The one with the black hair. Um, I'm talking about. It's not Danny, yeah. right? Not Danny mm -hmm. who plays Damien. No, I think his name is Jesse or something like that. Uh, is, he gay? Now. is he gay? Yeah, I, you know what? I think he is. Like, I, I'm like, actually, I think he is, right? Oh. <laughs> oh, I have no idea. Sure. Okay, so um, I, I don't think I gave you the questions. Did I give you the questions? You did, yeah. I, got I did? Mm -hmm. Yay! I'm, I'm like <laughs> navigating through... 10 different people right now and you're like my fifth person so i just wanted to make sure everyone had the questions because some of them hit differently for different people right um, but to right. just give you and everyone else um uh like a reason why i'm doing this so i have a queer quest class with rebecca yes love where, her which is where you and i met actually <laughs> at last year and um uh you know we have the end of the year project and uh she you know i created this project that i wanted to do like a documentary style mm -hmm. uh, of me asking questions to different black and queer people but because of covid um i'm kind of we're only like i only have these interviews these zoom interviews that i could do but right I mean, I don't have to see more people. I mean, yeah, I don't have to see more people in, in like real life. So I have more opportunities to interview more people. I so, love it. That's true. So, so I'm That's just, true. I'm gonna try and interview as many people as I can. So um, <laughs> that's where I'm at. And um, I also feel honored to be asked for this. I mean, like you know, it feels good. You know. <laughs> 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 I think your voice is is so important like you and I have had a lot of important conversations about blackness about queerness and where that falls in line and because you and I have shared like queer th like theoretical spaces theory spaces I I'm assuming and I know for sure that this, this conversation could go in all kinds of ways because we share like a shared language yeah so excited yeah so let's start this off uh, tell me about yourself what is your name your age uh, and your occupation okay um well my name is Dwayne Kamau Horton um my parents wanted me I'm a twin so um there's that and my parents wanted um both of us to have um kind of a link to um, African heritage so they gave us both African middle names um and Kamau means um uh, silent warrior um, and my um, brother's middle name means uh, travels far. So um, Dwayne Kamau Horton, uh, I'm 27 years old um, and it's interesting I think of the word occupation in so many different ways. Um, I think like there's um, what I do to make money um, but there's also um, you know what I kind of like feel spiritually assigned as as well. Um, so to make money, I'm an outreach representative. I work for San Francisco's Academy of Art University. Um, a very interesting position. Uh, I do like to kind of talk to kids in that way and kind of herald them into um, uh, higher education if it's the right place for them, but really to just, you know, let them know the ropes a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but just like spiritually assigned wise, I feel so much more attuned with, um, with writer, with, with healer. Um, and I mean writer in kind of like two different ways. I mean, writer as in like explorer. So like, mm. um, as in like metaphorizing things. Cause I love to work with fantasy in, in a lot of my writing. Um, and one of the reasons is because um, I just saw a lot of lack of uh, black people, but also black gayness in sci-fi. Um, and I think it's really important for those of us who come from these um, intersections to write our own stories. Um, so that's part of it. Um, 
the other part is to um, kind of write this blueprint of what could happen mm -hmm. um, in an imagined world where um, people have superpowers or where um, we take the metaphor of sadness and make it um, a, a, a being that sits on someone's shoulders. Mm -hmm. And like, how can we deal with it that way? Um, and then kind of trying to translate that. Um, so I find like that's kind of where like an intersection of my own work comes in was like writer and educator and just kind of um, wanting to um, uh, not just um, write fantasy, but also do it with a purpose as well. Um, so there and um, also healer, I would say. Um, I think that's a lot of the um, work that I try to do in my writing because it's a lot of the work that I have to do for myself too. Mm -hmm. um, this growing up uh, black and gay in the Midwest, um, having being the only gay person in my immediate family, you know, I, I learned a lot of things to survive and to um, uh, make sense of the world um, as it was that um, now as, as a grown adult who um, has the ability to kind of support themselves and uh, is fortunate enough to be able to do that, um, I have to unlearn those kinds of things and um, kind of recreate um, in so many ways. So um, the work that I try to do is to um, also heal those who um, kind of saw what I saw growing up. I, I hope that wasn't too ta tangential or anything. <laughs> I look at whatever you feel is your spirit is the right answer. I just okay. want to feel open enough um, to express themselves. Um, when did you realize that, you know what, writing is, is me, this is what I'm going to do and this is how I'm going to use it? That is a really good question because, um, I don't know, growing up, I've always felt like a creative person. Mm -hmm. And I think that like, when you feel that way, there's so many different kinds of creative outlets that you can kind of, um, gravitate towards to, but sometimes um like growing up the way i grew up like as a gay black person in a in a um really heterosexual household you know i, I wasn't able to do the all the artistic things that i wanted to do as a kid um so like drawing painting things like that like my father like was like really gymnastics things like that my father was like no like you can't do that you're a boy mm -hmm. um so um I, I wasn't really able to explore a lot of art forms, um, but writing was an art form that I didn't necessarily need um, to go out of my way to do. Yeah, you don't um, need permission to write, you just need a pen and paper. Exactly, and that's what I gave myself the, um, the option to do um, mm -hmm. as, as somebody who was creative and wasn't really allowed to um, express that as a young age, at a young age. Um, so it started off as poetry, really. Um, I would write down like in class, <laughs> I would be so bored. When I was like younger, um, I was like, I think I've always been smart, but I didn't get like great grades when I was younger. And I think that had a lot to do with a lot of things going on in my life at the time, but um, it, was what it was what it was. But you know, I, I daydreamed in class a lot. And I would just like be writing poetry in the margins of my notes. Um, and I do it so often. And I remember um, one time I, I had to turn in one of these sheets of paper and I forgot that I had to do so. And it was like, all this writing was on it. And I remember it was, it was in my health class and my health teacher, she, um, she looked at the piece of paper and she was like, who wrote this poem? Like, was, this, was that you? And I was like, oh no, I don't know who wrote the poem. Like, you know, I was, I was so, like, <laughs> like, like, I think obviously it was definitely me. I think she knew that. Um, I think asking was definitely a formality. Um, but I just kind of wasn't um, comfortable, I don't know, to really um, say, like, yes, this was mine and to kind of own that at the moment. Um, but I think, like, um, writing has always kind of been there, um, even before acting. Um, but writing also kind of developed my acting in some ways, I want to say. Um, but I, I did that um, also in high school as well. So that was like another um, 
artistic pursuit that I was kind of allowed to do, um, mm -hmm. even though it wasn't necessarily like looked down, looked down upon like fondly, I think by my father in particular. Um, but, um, you know, I was still, that was like kind of me claiming this art thing a little bit more, like I'm going to do this. Um, and I was actually good, so. <laughs> if you feel comfortable um, uh, answering this, what is your gender expression and your sexual identity? Yeah, I would love to answer that. Um, so it's weird, like um, I, I definitely, um, identify as cis. So I guess I want to um, go there. Like, um, I think having a trans experience is a really, um, uh, like it's an experience. Like, and I don't think that like knowing that I'm cis is like, um, oh, how do I put this? Let me see. Um, I think I really respect and honor like what trans people know about themselves mm. um, to the point where I know that I'm cis because I know that I view things a little bit differently I think um so that being said I think my gender expression um is like another level of my like who I am mm. um because I know and I acknowledge the feminine spirit that is inside of me um and we were it's funny because we were reading this um because we were in that class with elmas too the um poets of color oh, class of color class yeah and there was that poem that this one woman um that this one woman wrote oh i can't remember the name I'll, i'm gonna have to get back to you in the name because i have the book poem about the poem was about all oh, right the poem was about um this um about a boy that was inside of this girl and she said that the boy came out and saved her on like certain occasions um yeah it was um it was a, it was a purple book um it was like a purple cover and what like the I, uh uh amy oh no 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 it wasn't her um was it ross gay i've been thinking about it? his book lately remember oh shit it had the flowers and the orange and the greens and the purples it was that one yeah it was ross gay's book it was something uh uh, something about flowers mm -hmm. about flowers on the cover oh god I'll, we'll remember it later i know right it's gonna come to us like right after <laughs> this. <laughs> that <it> is. <laughs> right um but that poem was what kind of like um made me realize or not even realize but kind of put words to what i felt like i know that there's like a feminine spirit inside of me um as well as a masculine spirit um and they are intertwined with each other they are the same um and they you know um it's just a part of who i am and i think that like as a kid i was really afraid of that part of me um because i was i just didn't have a model of what other um like gay black people looked like um that was like not what was shown on tv um and that was really hard you know so I think that I shied away from certain parts of myself, but like they've always been there. And I'm the type that loves to keep those things and to express them when I have the opportunity to. Um, so yeah, like I've done drag before and um, I've won the competition that I was into. Okay. Um, it was a really magical experience. Um, I did Pretty Girl, I performed Pretty Girl Rock by Carrie Hilson. Carrie Hilson, mm -hmm. Yeah, look, <laughs> that was just my rock. song, like, and, um, it was just so much fun. And I really was, I felt like I was able to kind of express another side of myself. Um, and, um, I feel at home with that person and I feel at home, um, when I'm not that person either. That was uh, actually my next question. Where do you find home? Home is um, truly and truly and truly within me. Mm. Um, like, it's hard for me to ever think of home being a physical space, um, just because I carry so much of everything within me. I think it's like, partly having an Aquarius moon and just being really independent in nature and Come on, Aquarius moon. <laughs> look right and yeah, just I say that. right and also rebellious sometimes yeah. um 
and you know we have a tendency to be able to like get up and go um and i think that that um means for me just like having myself my personality the jokes that i share with myself the inside jokes that i have the the smoke sessions i have with myself the the writing dates that i take myself on like all of that is just um me being at home um and it's it's interesting um because i'm also like in a long term relationship right now mm-hmm. and we have a home and um like that feels like kind of conjoined Mm-hmm. Um, but I always like still have this, like the, yes. who I am too. Um, so it's, um, yeah, like it's, it's really, I think like my home is like on the run with me, like just like pumping in my body as I'm like walking around. Like, you know, what's so weird. I, I went overseas, uh, for, for, uh, the Christmas break, the winter break. And mm-hmm. I remember being on a bus stop in, in London and just being like, I've never felt more at home than mm. I do now. And it wasn't because I was in London. It was because, like, I finally felt like my spirit and, like, my self, like, that 3D self were, like, so, like, where I was. I knew I was where I was supposed to be in that moment. Mm-hmm. And there's not, I mean... I don't think people get that feeling often. Yeah. So it's interesting yeah. that you're able to tap into that. Mm-hmm. I think it's, um, it's one of those things because sometimes I also feel disconnected to my, with myself. Um, and there are situations in life that like kind of take me away from who I feel like I know I am. Um, and in those situations, I don't feel at home and it gives me like this really anxious feeling um but being outside like amongst flowers is kind of another thing that like just um I guess makes me feel that like gives me that sense too um I remember when I first moved here (laughs) I um uh well originally I'm from Cleveland Ohio so I drove all the way over here um to for graduate school and um and to you know work on the writing more and the only place that I, places that I used to go to, like outside of, you know, hangouts with, you know, bars and, and stuff like that, were botanical gardens. I went to like all of them in Berkeley and Oakland and uh, San Francisco. Um, and it just, you know, it just kind of restores me a little bit too, just to like be amongst them. <laughs> what are you searching for? Um... I really think I'm searching for, um, like, okay, so I guess I'll just say one of the first things that came to my mind, um, it's, I guess, a very, like, social, political standpoint, but um, I think I'm searching for a a way out um, in the sense of um, a reimagining of this world where like black gay people were black people where other oppressed peoples um are not oppressed um and can also find power um within not being oppressed and kind of live within that power um i took this class a long time ago in my undergrad uh because i was doing some philosophy classes at that time and this one class we took was called um, uh, uh, what was it? the something of the oppressed um, studies of the oppressed or something along those lines. Um, and one of the philosophers that we um, like were studying um, basically said that um, in order for an oppressed group to not be oppressed, um, they have to go through something like, you know, realize they're oppressed, go through something, and then make terms with it so that they know they're not oppressed again. Um, So that's basically to say that the oppressor can't just be like, okay, I'm done oppressing you now, so it's over. Mm. And it's be over. Because, um, like, it's really important for us to, um, to, to, to fight. Um, And I guess that's, 
I'm searching for that, like, um, that mixture of, of, um, of fight, um, but also of just like game plan um, that can happen so that oppressed groups can find their power. Um, and I don't know, I think for me, the way that I kind of express that a lot is through my writing. It sounds like you're really invested, not in, in I want to say a queer utopia or like a black queer utopia, but I feel like utopia is such a, uh, it doesn't do the world justice because utopia is like perfection. But it sounds right. like you're invested in, yeah, reimagining or like a reality um, that just at this moment doesn't feel like tangible. It yeah. Reminds, it reminds me of uh, when we went to see Alicia Garza uh, talk about the um, uh, the black future. She's amazing. That talk was like everything I needed for this entire year. Same, like, same. like I feel like I, I felt like after I left that conversation and we talked about this, it was just like everything that d does not currently feel possible became possible. But also I left with that from that meeting or from that conversation feeling like, you know what, there's work to be done and sitting around complaining isn't going to do it. Like you Isn't got to right? start facilitating solutions to these problems. Think beyond the problem. Exactly. Um, and that thinking beyond the problem is where the, all of the work gets done. Yeah. And like, that was like another thing that I think I took from Alicia that night, um, that it goes like beyond the dichotomies that we're taught to play within mm. um, and it reaches to that bigger picture and that's where we have to work from nice uh who's the first person on screen or in music or on stage that you felt uh connected to it's really funny because i think i was just talking to um one of my other black gay friends from home mm -hmm. about this mm -hmm. um and we were kind of recounting that like we felt like we didn't have a lot of role models growing up like we felt like we didn't see somebody in media that made us feel like oh like that's who i want to be when i'm older or that's the type of um attitude i want to have about this situation um just because us growing up we didn't see a lot of that black gay representation mm -hmm. um so i think often for us like i know for me specifically I looked at role models that were kind of outside of my own experience and picked certain things that I liked about them and was like, okay, you know what? Like, this is what, this is what I admire. You know, this is what I want to, um, this is what I like personally. So this is what I'm gonna like. Um, and in a way, like now that I'm thinking about it, I think it kind of allowed me to have more of a freer sense of the word role model. Wow. Um, because, like, I think, I don't think that one person can, like, really, um, you know, um, be all that you have to role model yourself after. Like, sometimes you do have to pick a, pick and choose, your, like, your traits from the people that you aspire to be. Um, but I think my mom was a role model. I really, like, um, I don't know, like, in my immediate family, she was the person who I always felt like, okay, like, I could talk to her, you know? And so I think we had a certain relationship. And so I saw her as a very hardworking person, um, but very graceful, very graceful. Um, I saw her as kind hearted. She's so kind, very compassionate. Um, and those are things that I aspire to be um, and make me feel good when I'm doing. Um, because like, it's like, okay, yeah, I can be like my role model. Like, you know, I can, I can <laughs> be graceful even when it's like crazy and I can like, you know, be kind even when it's like, that's, you know, the situation is like mad or angry or something. Um, so there's that. And I try to always go above and beyond. Um, I don't know. I had like a lot of like, um, like women who were my role models growing up, I think as well. Um, there's like, always a certain community that you felt connected to um i think my community um but also like in media um mm -hmm. too i would say um 
Buffy the Vampire Slayer, oh my gosh. Like, I'm sorry, like, but she, <laughs> growing up, like, that show gave me, like, as a young gay, as a young black gay growing up, that show really, like, you know, it gave me something to laugh at. Um, and I felt like, you know, it was just, I don't know, it was, it was, it was everything to me. I really enjoyed I like it. There's a trend of, like, black gay men, like, really feeling connected to Buffy. Yeah. I don't know I don't what know it is, exactly. but it keeps popping up on the internet for sure. That is so funny. <laughs> I, something about Buffy, something about Willow, something about Xander, something about that whole line of slayers, one in every generation, this badass woman, like, kicking ass. Um, it just was such... I think um, also at the time, because like we really don't get the representation we deserve. Like there's so much variance in human, like everything that we see such a small amount of that represented. Yeah. But Buffy really was like, I don't know that show for me. <laughs> like, I feel that. <laughs> um, when do you feel most safe? Mm. That's a really good question. Um, safety is also an interesting thing to think about um, just as gay people. Um, there's like always another layer that um, that's there. Um, I think I feel most safe when I'm with my community. Like when I'm with like a group of people that um, I love, you know, um, that feels like a protection, a, a safety net around me. Um, it feels like a protection spell around me. Um, I feel safe with my baby, you know, every now and then when, we, when we're cuddled up at night and, um, you know, just holding each other, I feel safe. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess those are, uh, but that's when I feel the safest. I remember, I asked this question because I remember talking or listening to Awan, Awan Mance at Mills, mm -hmm. and Awan had said something to effect of uh, they don't believe in safe spaces, or I, I can't remember if they don't believe in safe spaces or they don't believe that spaces could be safe. And that kind of, like, I kind of sat up a little bit and thought about it, and I'm like, as black and queer people is there a safe space like can i walk through the world and just be like i'm 100 percent good <laughs> you know yeah that's 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 a really good point though i i mean the answer for me i have found is no mm. um like the heteronormativity and heterosexism is so strong here but also in the entire world yeah. that oftentimes just being gay just being yourself is grounds for some type of moral punishment from others um so i hesitate to really say that there like are large spaces but you do have your spaces like atlanta you have your spaces like san francisco you have your spaces like you know the outside the bay area a little bit more um but you know you have your spaces where it's more comfortable to be gay. And honestly, that's why I'm still here. Like, mm -hmm. going back home, like, is so, it feels like I've gone back in time. Wow. The attitudes are different. Like, just me being myself and living my best gay life is, like, you know, it, I feel like it really, like, um, it doesn't freak people out, but it definitely, it definitely like widens their eyes a little bit. You know, they're like, How you know, <laughs> like they're, they're not, they're kind of taken aback that somebody who's black and gay can love themselves as much as I do mm -hmm. and be themselves and exist in the hood spaces and exist in the proper spaces and be all of who I am. And, you know, they're like, whoa. But like, you know, when I come here, um, and, the, and the, you know, just to kind of speak on that a little bit more, it's like you feel that woe, too. 
like, you know, you, you're being yourself and you feel unfazed, but you know, you can feel the stares, you can feel people looking. But when I come here, it's like, nobody bats an eye. Like I could walk down the street, hold my boyfriend's hand, nobody's, you know, it's just normal. And that's what I really appreciate, you know, especially I think I may even have a certain appreciation for it because I grew up in the Midwest where I didn't get that at all. Um, so I think like being here, just it just feels like this fresh breath of air. Um, even though, you know, you could still face discrimination for being gay here. So um, yeah, I don't know, I feel that. <laughs> When's the first time you realized you were black? Probably when I was like four. I want to say. Um, what was that memory? I was in um, preschool. I believe it was preschool. Um, and I don't, I don't think that may you might be, because my brother and I, we've always been like really individualistic. So we've always wanted to do separate things. Um, so that included being in separate classes. And I don't think we were in the same class or preschool either. Um, but yeah, I was the only black person there, like only yeah. black person. Um, and like, you know, for granted, it, is, it was a nice preschool. Um, but it, I was like, damn, like, who are these, all these other white folks? Like, what? <laughs> um, you been in preschool just looking around? I was looking suspect at these people. I was <laughs> like, I ain't never seen y'all. What are y'all going to do to me? <laughs> like, uh -huh. I, I don't know y'all. Um, but I made, um, you know, being, I think I was more of a social butterfly when I was younger. Um, and when I got older, like, I just started to, like, see people for a little bit, see people a little bit too intensely, and it just kind of burned me a little. So I was like, eh. I don't know if I can be around people like this without it soaking up so much of my energy. But before I realized all of that and like, you know, before all of that, I used to really like being around people and like, you know, I made a lot of friends. So preschool, like I was, even though I was just like with a whole set of people, I had no idea, like all these white faces, it was still easy for me to be friends um, with like all of them. So I made some good friends from preschool. So, you know, I don't, I don't know them at all anymore. Um, do you still remember feeling like I am black, they are white? <laughs> yeah, definitely though. Definitely though. It's like a really like, um, and I also like, <laughs> this is just like a child ignorance thing, um, I think. Um, but like, I also um, always thought that like black people were like my complexion or darker. Oh, wow. And so, like, when my fan, like, I had, but I did have a good friend who was very, very light. Um, and I was like, oh, he's light skinned. He's not black. Um, and that was kind of my impression until, like, somebody broke it down to me, like, for real, for real, and was like, no, they're black. When they're, did they're that, what age did that happen at? Or when did that happen? I think I had to be like six. Okay. Yeah, like maybe six so, or seven. Like there's light skinned black people, there's dark skinned black people, there's yeah. there were yeah. a plethora of, of skin complexions. Mm -hmm. When's the first time you realized that you were queer? Oh, honey, I always knew. <laughs> <laughs> I think I always knew. I don't know if I was ever confused about it. Um, I just think that I was always afraid to come out. I think that was my biggest thing. I think I always knew I was gay. I always wanted to do gay things, as in have sex <laughs> with other gay people. But like, um, like I always knew at the same time that I wasn't straight and I was always afraid to come out. Um, now, I, I'm curious, and you don't have to answer this question, but is your brother also a queer person? No, he's not. Yeah, that's okay. Wow. No, he's not. Yeah, he's, he is. He is 100% heterosexual. So how did that play out between uh, both of you? Like, 
one being queer and one being straight like was there any tension between you two was there like an understanding did he know as as you knew or did he not know like what was that process like being like a, a gay twin essentially the gay yeah. one out of the twins <laughs> right <laughs> well honestly honestly to goodness Lee, i'm going to therapy for it um it was hard yeah it was really hard i always felt like my brother was what my father actually wanted out of his children oh, really? um you know like he was always got really good grades he was really smart he was really athletic like really all of the things that like a parent wants out of their children never got in trouble of course i didn't really get in trouble either but you know I was always a little bit more uncouth than my brother um and I don't know like um yeah so um it, it was I was jealous of him a lot of the times because I felt like um my parents like doted on him in ways like they didn't see them like doing and I didn't feel like I was getting the same attention from them um so that was a big problem for me because like okay it's enough that you brought me into this world Mm -hmm. do not shade me like this and that was like really the resentment that I felt for a really long time so um I went to therapy um and I talked a little bit about that um I went for a completely different reason but we ended up talking about family matters and my therapist was just kind of like well because I had this resentment for my brother and was making me mad at him because I felt like you know like that was like you know like I just felt like they, I wasn't being seen and I kind of like blamed him for it um and my therapist was like well you know you never came out to your brother and um you know um you can't be mad at him for um a conversation that you guys never had and you know your brother was probably trying to protect you at some times in your life um and without kind of having that conversation, he didn't know how you wanted to be protected, but you can't really be mad at him for that. Do you think he knew yeah. as as you knew? Because you know how they say twins have like a, a special mm -hmm. bond. Do you think he knew? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I definitely think he knew. He totally knew. I mean, when I came out to him, he said he knew. But <laughs> it was like, <laughs> but like, I don't know, like, when we were able to get some like physical space between each other so like when we went to different places for college like i think we were able to appreciate each other a little bit more and so our relationship like is way better than it used to be um and like you know i kind of came to some of my own understandings um about like how i dealt with my sexuality growing up and you know um you know what that kind of made me believe and just like some other things too so um i i was able to kind of come to some terms and some things with my own self too and that um that really helped me um kind of become a little bit more um equaled out i guess i can say a little bit more evened out um in my feelings towards him um but also just where I was placing some of my anger to um, was misplaced. Um, and I think that a lot of it kind of boiled down to a conversation I wanted to have with my dad. And um, that was just like, that was, it was a harder conversation um, just because he's my dad, but also because he's so much older than us too. Um, like he's in his seventies right now. So um, having a conversation with him is like, you know, you have to you have to weigh the risk assessment of it all um and really understand like how important it is for you to be angry at somebody or how important it is for you to um um uh um emote in a certain way that could like damage a relationship because I don't know, like my father and I have, we, you know, I came, when I came out to him, he was like really upset, he was mad, but like, you know, like I knew then that we had like this like level of love between each other, you know, like it's like gonna go like too far underneath that. Um, and so that was kind of what also helped me like have certain conversations too. I write about it. I'm gonna, um, you know, I, I did, um, you know, I do my weekend reading, so. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, for uh, those who might be seeing this interview, anybody's going to see this interview? I'm going to release it on uh, 420. 
Okay, so for those who don't know, you can go ahead and check out my page, Earth 120. I do weekend readings. I'm keeping y'all entertained during this quarantine because we all got to stay in the house anyways. Mm -hmm. So you might as well listen to some Black science fiction. So far, it has not been very gay, but um, it's getting there. And what so. I'll be doing is uh, on the website where your name is, I'll put the link there. So all people have to do is click it and they'll be right directed to your um to yes. for content. Oh, exciting. Yes, if please. If you do. could talk to your 12-year-old self, uh, what would you say to him? <laughs> I knew this question was going to get me like this. <laughs> oh, man. Um, no, it's because like 12, like 12 year, 12 year olds, like that was a very hard year um for me i was getting um teased a lot for being gay um Wait, the, you knew that you were gay at that point or other people figured i knew that was the thing i knew i was gay but i never like when people tease me about it i always said i wasn't because i felt like it was going to be losing an argument or like i was going to be you know instantly ridiculed even more and I wasn't comfortable in myself yet so like when when the kids were like oh you gay you gay you gay I'd be like no I'm not no I'm not because I wasn't comfortable yet to say you know and I wasn't like and it and it's not like you know once you say you're gay it's like okay you know <laughs> it's like it's not a big thing you know once you say you're gay it's like oh 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 you gay oh you're gay oh you know it's like you get that ridicule and then it doesn't just stop with the kids it goes to the adults and then it you know yeah and then yeah, as a kid you know how like like kids who haven't even participated in any sexual type of sexual activity right are already kind of pigeonholed into like gay like straight like mm -hmm. they, to make fun of someone for being gay is to assume that everyone is straight it's to assume that everyone's straight it's to assume that being gay is bad it's to mm -hmm. uh, attribute negative qualities to um it's to follow a stereotype mm -hmm. and that's the shit that i was like okay i can't do so if i was to give my 12 year old self any advice um I would steer away from things like it gets better. It does, but you have to. F I would. I want you to feel it get better. I don't want you to anticipate it getting better. Mm. Um, what I want you. What I. What I would want from my twelve-year-old self to understand is that um, you aren't the only twelve-year-old going through the same thing. Um, so that I would want my twelve-year-old self to know that. Um, and I would also want to just, you know, um, tell them that um, writing will save your life, you know, um, and that um, you can trust your mother and that um, your brother doesn't hate you. Oh, wow. Wow. That's how I felt that one. Whew. <laughs> what do you want to hear from your 60 year old self? Um, I want to hear that we are on a motherfucking yacht. That's what <laughs> I want to hear. <laughs> I want to hear that this hard work that we're doing, that we will continue to do, um, you know, um, I want to hear how courageous we were or how courageous we had to be. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to hear, um, I want to hear some more war stories of what's, you know, of, of something to watch out for. Like, <laughs> that's what, because now is, you know, the time when the rubber meets the road and you got to go. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I'm trying to do. And so um, I, I look forward to speaking to my 60 year old self and expecting some fruits. Nice, nice. <laughs> How do you experience love, Dwayne? Ooh, love is like a very tranquil feeling when the norm is chaos. Mm -hmm. Love is like feeling your body being lifted a little bit off of the ground, but you're like 
physically is still on the ground. Mm. Love is like, for me, love is like smoking a long blunt after a good, well-rolled blunt after a long-ass day. And I know I deserve this blunt. Oh, and we really smoking it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I love that. These are all very like sensual ex- experiences. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. This is my last question, my love. Oh, I'm so thankful for you. Um, if you could change your identity, would you? Why? Why not? um so I don't know like okay so I love who I am so I don't think I would ever change this um but like if we existed in a world where we had superpowers like yeah I would want to like um I don't know I definitely would want to kind of like own my empathic power is a little bit even like sharper and just like I don't know like make it look somewhere on my face like you know maybe have like a tattoo that like signifies my level of empath and mm-hmm. like okay. <laughs> but um oh that was a good idea maybe I'll write a story about that okay. um, maybe but um I don't know yeah no I don't think I would ever change anything about myself um I, I thought about it because just like um, I've been through traumatic experiences before. So having known that, like, yes, if I were to be very honest, there were certain things about my life that I would, like, go back and be like, okay, don't go in that direction, go this way. Is, is it as a result of being Black or queer, or is it just um, personal things that you've experienced in your own life that you're like, mm, I, I'd rather not to have, have experienced that? I think it was a result of being Black and gay, but not... Um, I don't think it was like, uh, like, you know, super causal. Like, I don't think it was like, I don't think that was like, I think it was a domino effect. Okay. Is I think is what I'm trying to say. And I don't think it was like a long domino effect. I think it was like, just like maybe a few dominoes in there. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, I think it was definitely kind of caused by that initial, um, I don't want to say trauma, but just the disappointment with life and knowing that I'm gay and that they're like, isn't a world that accepts gay people. Like knowing that as a young gay kid, I was very disappointed with Mm -hmm. everyone around me. I was like, are you guys, is everyone serious? Like we're all gonna play pretend and just pretend gay people don't exist when they obviously do. Like, this is the level of humanity that I'm being born into right now. So I walked in and said, wait, what the fuck is this? I didn't order this. Take it back. This ass world, right? What the fuck? Um, Yeah. I don't know. Where was I going with that? I don't remember. I mean, I, my question was, uh, would you change? And you're like, you, you kind of said, I wouldn't change knowing like how I got here. But also at the same time, there's a lot of shit that I didn't sign up for. Yeah, exactly. And that's a really good, um, I think, way for me to, to for, I think it's a good way to be, for it to be put. Because, um, yeah, I didn't sign up for this ghetto rush shit. Um, and like, the trauma that I experienced, I think, was just a mishandling of, like, things that could have been handled very well. But it kind of led me to fall through a, a few cracks. Um, and so I developed some bad habits, um, just kind of, like, in the process in terms of that. Um, and, you know, um, bad di- habits die hard, and it can be... Um, you know, a, such a process. And I think for me, um, it was a really hard one. And um, yeah, so I just, yeah, there were some things that I think were kind of caused by that, um, for sure. Mm-hmm. But um, now where I am at, in my life, um, I don't think that I would change. Um, yeah, I don't think I would change anything about myself. I said this last question was my last question, but this is really my last question because you and I have <laughs> talked about this um intimately and thoroughly um what is your stance on black gay love (sighs) dating within the race and and being clear about that wanting that uh yeah yeah 
Who? That's okay. Because we have talked about this. Um, yeah. I think that. Um, so we live in a heteronormative world. We also live in a Eurocentric world. Mm -hmm. And we live in a world where whiteness is seen as the most attractive as a, or the pinnacle of what beauty is right now. <clears throat> I don't personally agree, but we live in a world where a lot of people kind of take that as truth. Um, and so my problem when it comes to Black gay men dating white gay men um, is... Um, I have no issues if the love is real, but oftentimes it's not. And it's because of the preconceived notions that, so I'm forced to believe or I'm forced to think in a corner of my mind that a black gay person loving a white gay person um, is a form of self-hatred or uh, it's, I hate to say it so roughly like that. Um, yeah. But <laughs> like, that's really how I feel because it's like, you don't love yourself enough to date those who look like you. Mm. You must not like how you look on the inside. Um, you must not like the complexion of your skin. You must believe some of the stereotypes they say about us. So you're going towards the pinnacle of beauty this, in this Eurocentric world um, and going with white men and only exclusively only dating white, you know, like that. It just doesn't, like, you know, I see self-hatred kind of written all over that. And self-hatred is so unattractive to me that when I see it in other people, like, and they don't know it, it just kind of, like, it makes me want to, like, talk to them and be like, yo. And on the other end, it also makes me kind of want to walk away. So it's difficult. Like, if, if the love is real, I don't have any issues with it. Like, more power to them if they can love each other outside of this, like, you know, racial shit that we have going on, then they have found something very special and they should hold on to that. But oftentimes it's just that other thing, it's just the self-hatred aspect. And then, you know, white people dating black people can also be fraught with racism. You know, they could just be trying to date a black person to, you know, um, to, because they, you know, we're all thugs and they want to be fucking with thugs. Like, you know. Yeah, like, you know, the, yeah, like, it's it's all of that that kind of goes into it and it's just like, and I personally don't think I could date a white person because I'm so in tune with the racial matters in America where if they didn't understand or tried to argue me down on a point, you know, where I know it was racist, <laughs> We're, we're gonna have to split ways. Why, why even go through that? Like, we're gonna just have to go. I'm not anyone's teacher. I'll teach yeah. some people that I'm in love with, you know, that I have love for, I'll do it for free. But oftentimes you still have to be in a moment to receive that. So, you know, I just be feeling like, mm -mm, like, okay. I, yeah. I remember I can't remember who I was talking to. I think it was Rehana, who I'm also interviewing by the way tomorrow. Yeah. But um I was it was someone and they're like, uh Mimi, would you date a white person? I said, you know what? I haven't dated a white person in like four or five years. Mm -hmm. And it's to the point like my interaction with white men in particular was just so negative and so bad. Like, I would try it today because I'm, like, old enough to get past some of those traumas. But, like, you got one motherfucking chance to fuck up. And that's it. Like, they, you're... Maybe, like, who we got to run up on? Like, don't... Because, look... <laughs> <laughs> I No, I ain't doing it with you. Right. Yeah, right. so I can see... It's interesting because... I for sure know some uh, black queer men, black gay men who only primarily date or, or black bisexual men who only date white women or who only date white boys. And it's just like. Oh, I have something to say about that too, though. Oh, yeah, go for um, it. The, I oftentimes feel that a lot of the um, gay men, like if you like, do have sex with women sometimes you have sex with a white woman and that's because they're seen as like really 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 like um submissive i think the white women are 
yes, I think white women are seen as submissive. I don't know, I don't at all, I know for a fact that all women are not, white women are not submissive at all, but they all like to play victim. Okay, I'm gonna move on, sorry. But <laughs> I felt that, I felt that anchor right there. Like, oh, they all like to play victim. <laughs> right. but sorry, but, um, okay. but no. <laughs> But um, but yeah, I think it's that idea that um, there's a woman who's submissive enough for them. I don't know. Like, I guess it's not really an unformed thought, but I think that there's a little racism in that too, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Interesting. But, yeah. Interesting. Wow. Is there anything that I uh, did not ask or any topic I did not hit that you would like to express right now? Um, oh, that's a good question. I don't know. These questions were so, I felt like I was discovering a little bit about myself too, just answering them. Um, and so I, I want to thank those questions. Thank you for those questions. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I guess I would just like to end with the word that um, querying the future is very important because it doesn't just mean um, a future where, um, you know, gay people are in power, but it does imply a future um, where we are more accepting and understanding of the roles, of the spiritual roles that we were meant to play coming here. Um, just because we have this physical body doesn't mean that it matches what's on the inside. And I think that's been so much of what um, um, trans people have been saying, um, but it's also so much of the obvious. And so what I want, um, I don't know, the people, I, what I want there to be an understanding of um, is that um, we really have to look on the inside and um, querying the future um, is um, a way to map that out. That was beautiful. That was so, so beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna stop the recording right now. Okay. All right, thank you.